Hi, my name is Dot Porter and I'm the Curator for Digital Research Services at the Kislak Center for Special Collections, Rare Books and Manuscripts, the University of Pennsylvania Libraries. I split my time in the Kislak Center with the Schoenberg Institute for Manuscript Studies, which is a research and development group that focuses on the study of manuscripts, primarily medieval manuscripts, both physical and digital. What I want to talk to you about today is VizCall. VizCall is a system for building models of the physical collation of manuscripts and then visualizing them in various ways. VizCall is a data model and it's also a set of tools. And up front, I'm going to tell you that at the moment, the tools that you can use for VizCall are, are sort of version 1.0. We have a collation modeler and a visualizer, and I'll show you both of those momentarily and show you how you can use them to build your own models and visualize them. We're in the process of developing version 2.0 right now. A few years ago, the Old Books New Science group at the University of Toronto, which is led by Alex Gillespie, got some Mellon grants to develop some work that included their own implementation of tools for building collation models, and that is now called VizCodex. Thanks to their generosity, we are using the VizCodex platform as a jumping off point for the next version of VizCall. So we are hoping by this fall, we'll have a, a new version of this that will do the same kind of thing, but it's gonna be nicer looking and a little more user friendly. So when that happens, I will be making a whole new video, but for now, I'm just gonna show you the thinking behind VizCall. We're gonna talk a little bit about what collation is. I expect most people watching this video already know about physical collation, but just in case, I will explain it to you. And then I'm gonna walk you through building a model and visualizing it using the current version of VizCall. This call was designed both for scholarly use and for institutional use. And obviously, this is a Venn diagram. There is, there is a huge overlap between what I'm referring to as scholarly and institutional. And this is not to imply that institutional use is not also scholarly. The difference being that in the use case of a scholarly user, you are a student or you're a faculty member, you're interested in making some kind of scholarly argument about a manuscript or a group of manuscripts, and you are using their physical construction as part of your argument. And you are going to need a tool that you can use to build models of the books and then map things onto them. I'm gonna say up front, version 1.0 does not do this mapping. You would have to do it on top. Version 2.0 will do mapping, which is really great and something that's very exciting about the second version. So for a scholarly user, at the moment, VizCall is sort of a starting point, and then you have to do a lot more outside of the VizCall system. Institutional use is you are a cataloger at an institution, you have a collection of manuscripts that you catalog as part of your work. And if you do this, you are already doing the collation work. You are creating or you are writing probably some kind of formula, collation formula or a collation description that goes into the records for these manuscripts, the library records that then go probably online or maybe they're printed in a book. This call was designed to serve both of these communities and has in fact done this. So I know personally lots of people who are scholars who are using this call as part of their work now, which is really gratifying to see people using it. And we have actually used it as pen on an institutional level, primarily as part of the Bibliophily project. So Bibliophily is the short name for Bibliotheca Philadelphiensis. This was a three-year grant-funded project funded by the Council on Library and Information Resources. And we digitized and put online about 475 codex manuscripts from 15 different institutions around Philadelphia. The Philadelphia Area Consortium on Special Collections Libraries, or PACSCL, played an enormous organizational role. And all of the institutions that took part in the grant are members of PACSCL, so we could not have done it without them. 
Lois Black, the PI of the project, is at Lehigh University, and Janine Pollock is at the Free Library of Philadelphia. Lois was the PI, and Janine and I were co-PIs on this project. Most of the manuscripts that were digitized as part of the project had already been cataloged to some extent or another. Every single one of them got a fresh pair of eyes, and that included looking at the physical collation. And we used VizCall as part of our cataloging workflow. We built models for every manuscript for which we could see a collation. Some manuscripts are, are, are perhaps they're very tightly bound or they're very complicated. And in those cases, we don't have collation models, but every manuscript where it was possible, we built a collation model. And then we generated the collation formulas that appear in the records out of the collation models. So that was really great. And then the collation models are actually visualized within the bibliophilia interface, which is also very exciting because that is not something that you see very often at all. That was good. So that's this call in a nutshell. First, I want to talk a little bit about, we'll take a little historical tangent because I think the history of looking at the physical manuscript, or at least at least of describing it as part of a manuscript description, is kind of an interesting thing to look at. So this is the catalog entry for the manuscript that's now at the British Library under the shelf mark Cotton Claudius B4. It's known as the Illustrated Old English Hexateuch. It's a fantastic manuscript. I'm very fond of it. But the important thing is here is looking at the physical description and it's at the very top under the title. So it's a codex, it is made of parchment, it's in folios, it has 156 folios. And this is all the information that we have in this 1802 catalog. 1957, N.R. Carr published his catalog of manuscripts containing Anglo-Saxon, and he has a much more extensive description which includes a collation formula. And it's there on the second line, collation of folios 1 through 156. That's the same information from the 1802 catalog. But then he describes the manuscript in detail, choir by choir. Choir 1 has eight leaves. It wants one. That means the first leaf in that choir is missing. The second choir has eight leaves. The third choir has four leaves plus one that has been added after the second leaf. And then more information, that is folio 17 in the current numbering has been added. Choirs four through nine have eight leaves. Choir 10 has six leaves plus a leaf that's been inserted after the fifth leaf. That is folio 74 has been added. And, and so on. And this is how you read a collation formula, if, if, you, if you don't know. Basically, there isn't a standard for collation formulas, however. So this is the way that Neil Kerr writes his formulas. Somebody else might write it in a different way. We came up with a, another way for bibliophily. So this is one of the complications of working in the system. Now we're going to talk about physical collation. So what is physical collation? Physical collation is the way that the manuscript is put together in terms of sheets of parchment or paper. A manuscript is made of gatherings or choirs that are formed by stacking sheets of parchment or paper on top of each other and then folding them to make a little booklet. And you could have one of these or you can have many of them and you would generally you would sew them together and that is what makes your manuscript so if you're looking at the physical collation of uh, a manuscript what you're looking at is how the choirs are put together and how the choirs fit together as a group so in order to use this call you need to have one of two things you can create a collation model from an existing formula. And I have actually done this a lot. And when we get to the portion of this tutorial where I am building the model, so you can see how it works, I'm going to be going from a formula because I don't, I'm at home. <laughs> COVID is outside, so I am inside. I can't go to the library, so I'm going to be making one. 
from a, an existing formula. But in order to make a formula, if you have a manuscript you're working from, you need to be able to determine the collation yourself. And so the next few slides, I'm going to show you some photographs of some, some ways that you can do this. And this is not it, and it's not always easy, but this is sort of an idea uh, of how you do it. So this is a manuscript that we cataloged as part of the Bibliotheca Philadelphiensis project. This is from the Free Library of Philadelphia, LC1428. It's a little manuscript. You can sort of tell how small it is here. I open it up and I start at folio one and I count the leaves and I count one, two, three, and then I get to this opening here. And it's a little bit hard to tell from the photograph because it's a little bit blurry, but the arrow is pointing to thread. There is thread that is sewn down the middle of the squire. And what this is telling me is that there have been three sheets of parchment that have been sewn together to make a choir. And we're in the middle of the choir now. So thread means you're in the middle of the choir. So I take note of this, that between three and four is the middle of the choir. So I keep going. And now I get to the opening that's six verso and seven recto. And there's a gap. You can see there's a very clear gap where the choirs are loose. And you can also see the sewing that's sort of holding them together. So what we're looking at is a full choir on the left and the rest of the book on the right. So we know that the first choir has six leaves. All right, we keep turning the leaves so we know that the second choir begins on the seventh leaf, folio seven. So we turn our pages and we get to 10, 10 and 11. And again, there's thread down the middle of this choir, which again is telling us we are in the center of the choir. We keep going, we get to 14 and 15, and now we're at 14. There are a few things happening here that are helpful if you're looking to do a collation. The first one is again, there's a gap, and you can see the sewing that's holding the choirs together. On the verso of the last folio of the choir that's ending is a word or words written there, and that's called a catchword. And a catchword, if the manuscript is bound correctly, the catchword will be the same word or couple of words that appear at the top of the following choir. And this was designed to help whoever was doing the binding. So if choirs got out of order, then the person doing the binding can check the catchwords to make sure that they're being bound in the correct order. This is helpful for us now because one, we can use them to help make our collations. If a manuscript is very tightly bound and you can't see where the sewing is, where one choir begins and another one ends because of gaps or because of sewing, you can still check for the catchwords. And if the catchwords are consistent, you can still make a collation, at least a good guess. It's, it's easier if the collation is what we call regular. That is where all of the choirs have the same number of leaves and there aren't any added or missing leaves. It is more difficult if leaves have been added or taken out but then sometimes you can use other context clues to tell what's going on if you end up with a choir that does have seven leaves or nine leaves, where clearly they're not all connected to each other. You can do things like look for the hair side and flesh side patterns through the choir of the leaves, or you can look for stubs that peek out in the gutter. If there's a stub, then the added leaf is going to be on the other side of that, things like that. So now we know we've come to the end of that choir. And so the first choir has six leaves and then the second choir has eight leaves and so on and so forth. For the next part of this video tutorial, we're going to make a collation model. Then we're going to visualize it both taking advantage of the digital images that we have of the manuscript and not because you can use VizCall to generate diagrams only, but you can also use it to generate what we call the bifolia view, where you can take manuscript images and organize them so it reveals what the bifolias would look like if you took the manuscript apart, which is an interesting thing to do. And depending on what your research needs are, it's potentially illuminating for scholarship.
So the manuscript that we are going to do today is the Collins Hours, Book of Hours, Use of Rome. It's at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, number 1945-65-4. I love this manuscript. It's very cute. It has these really delightful borders with these very charming people <laughs> in the margins. Some of them are men, some of them are women. There are pages with angels and every page where there are these decorated borders, you have these little people. In addition to having these sort of charming borders, it also has a very complex collation. You can see here, this is the formula that we generated from a model that somebody made, probably Nick Herman made, as we were doing the cataloging for Bibliophily. This is a little bit fake. In real life, most likely, you would have a manuscript, you would have access to a manuscript, and you would use this call to make the model from the book itself. We don't have a book with us. I'm at home. Uh, the PMA is not going to give me the Collins hours. So here is, so we're just gonna go from the collation formula here. This is um, the Bibliophily interface which is gorgeous and user-friendly, but it's not actually what I'm gonna be using for most of this tutorial. I'm going to be referring to Open, which has all of the same information as the Bibliophily interface, including the collation. So I just need to be able to see the collation uh, large enough. All right, so there's the collation. And let me go to the how-to of the biz call. So to build a model, you go to the collation modeler here. So I will open. There's the collation modeler. We're going to create a new manuscript. The manuscript of the Collins hours. The shelf mark is PMA 1945-65-4. It doesn't require a URL, but we'll put in the open URL in any case. There we go. Number of choirs. It has 24 choirs. And let's take a quick look at how these are coming out. So, so choirs one and two have six leaves. Choir three has eight with a bunch of changes. Four has seven, five has 13, six has seven to four, 11. So, Lots going on, lots of different numbers of leaves and choirs. One way we could do this would be to build it choir by choir. Let's not do that. Let's go ahead and make 24 choirs. And we'll say to start that each choir has eight leaves. And we're just gonna be making a lot of changes here. So we're gonna create the manuscript. Here we are, Collins Hours. And you can see it generated 24 choirs of eight leaves. And if you click on them, you can see the, see the information. It assumes that every leaf is conjoined. And it doesn't give you the information here, but leaf one is conjoined with leaf eight. Leaf two is conjoined with leaf seven. This is what this call does. You tell it, how many leaves there are, which if any of them are missing or have been added or are singles, and it determines where the conjoints are and then gives that to you in a model which you can visualize. It also automatically does folio numbering. So the folios are gonna be numbered from one all the way to the end, which is 192. That's 24 choirs of eight leaves each. As we start making changes, as we add leaves and subtract leaves, the numbering is going to change. And we have control over that too. And it's very easy to do renumbering. It's, it's another one of the things that I kind of love about this call is renumbering is very easy. All right, so let's go here. So one and two actually have six leaves. Okay, we're going to edit choirs one and two to give them six leaves. And all we have to do is say, remove that. Remove the last two, so now we have six leaves. Update the choir, and then delete the last two leaves. So that means six and six. Update choir. 
um, if you're if you don't work a lot with um, books of hours, I'm going to tell you that it's really typical for books of hours to either have an opening choir that has 12 leaves or that has two opening choirs that have six leaves each. And that's because books of hours typically open with a calendar, calendar, one leaf for each month. So you get 12 leaves, which will either be one single choir or two choirs. Even if the manuscript itself is otherwise regular choirs of eight. So you're really gonna expect to see 12 at the opening one way or the other. Now we go to choir three. A limitation of the collation formula that we're using is determining exactly what the pluses and minus mean. Plus means that it's a single leaf. It doesn't necessarily mean that it was added. It just means it's a single leaf that's sort of sitting there. Minus means that the leaf is missing. So when you have minus seven followed by plus seven, what this means is there was a leaf seven, it was a single leaf, and now it's missing. These are all things that we're going to now make changes to for choir three. So we go to edit choir three, and uh, one, three, five, and seven are single. One, three, five, and seven are single, and leaf seven is missing. And it doesn't have a folio number. So we're going to delete that and leave that number blank. So the options for modes are original, added, replaced, and missing. We've used missing for leaf seven. If these single leaves had been added to the manuscript later, we would mark them as added. If there were there was a leaf that had been removed and then replaced with another leaf later that had the same text on it, we would use replaced. I very rarely use replaced, but it's definitely a thing that happens. In this case, all of the leaves are original, even the single ones, and so we'll use the original label there. The folio numbering is already off because remember we, we removed two leaves from the end of the first two choirs. So we're going to do some renumbering now. So we're going to, we don't want to add leaves. No, we're going to update the choir. First, we're going to make sure that it made the changes. So one, three, five, seven are single. Leaf seven is missing. That's all good. But you'll see that now there are these renumbering here, and they're actually up here as well. Because as soon as we removed the last two leaves, the numbering got off. We removed the ones that had been seven and eight, and now it jumps right from six to nine. In the manuscript, the first leaf of choir two is numbered seven. So we are going to change it to seven, and then we're going to say renumber from here. And now it's all been renumbered. So from seven to 12, and now this one as well is numbered all the way through. And you can see where I took out the number, it recognized that there was no folio number there and skipped over it. So that's choir three. And we'll, we'll go all the way through and then we'll do one final renumbering at the end. I think that's easier than renumbering every time you change something. All right, choir four has seven leaves. One, three, and five are single. Choir four has seven leaves, so we're gonna delete that. One, three, and five are single. Now, just as an example, let's say that I was looking at this choir and I determined that it had seven leaves and I knew it had two single leaves, but I forgot, I either didn't notice or I forgot to note that this one is single. When I go to update the choir, it's gonna yell because the number of non-single leaves can't be odd because what, what this is doing behind the scenes is finding the leaves that aren't single and trying to match them up and turn them into conjoins. And if I have a seven leaf choir that doesn't have the right number of single leaves, it's gonna balk at that. It doesn't wanna do that. So I'm gonna try again. So I'm gonna remove that eighth leaf again. 
one, three, and five, update choir. So that's one of the ways that the, the current this call sort of protects you from making mistakes. If it gives you an error, then that gives you the opportunity to go back and check. All right, what's choir five? Has 13 leaves. One, three, six, nine, and 11 are single. Choir five. And you might be wondering, why are there all these single leaves? There's a very good reason for it. When we go and look at the manuscript, it's gonna become really clear why there are all these single leaves at the front. So first we're gonna add some leaves, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, and 13. So we added five more leaves. One, three, six, nine, 11. One, three, six, nine, 11. And I'm going to keep going. All right, all the way done. We did all 24 choirs. Now we need to do the renumbering, the final renumbering. If we go and look here, we see the modern foliation is in pencil one through 188. So when we're done, we should have 188 folios. Uh, I haven't tested this, <laughs> so we're gonna find out. All right, so we come up here and we have one through six, seven through 12, 13 through right 19, that was fine. Let's see, okay, here we go. So we go from 26 to 28. So we need to renumber from 27, so we double check, yes, 27, renumber from here. All right, and then we come to the end. <gasps> No. Oh no. Numbering's wrong. What did I do wrong? All right, so I figured out what I did wrong, and I actually made a couple of errors. The first error is that I wasn't careful enough when I did the last choir, and I marked leaf two as being the missing single, but it's actually leaf four. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna fix this error I'm going to get leaf four, and then here is leaf four is missing. The issue with the 
page numbering or the folio numbering is because I neglected to remove the folio numbers from the missing leaves. So the, the leaves have been missing, they don't have numbers, so these are, are, are actually blank. The next thing that I need to do, I update the choir, and then we go back here and we are going to renumber again. So choir 23 ends with 174, choir 24, 179. So we're going to then renumber from 180, renumber from here, and then we'll come down here and we shall see that now we have 188 leaves, which is the number that we expected. So yay, we have completed the collation model for Collins hours. The last thing that we're gonna do regarding the, the model itself, we're going to download the leaves XML, and this will simply download an XML file to my downloads folder. Here it is. And then that is what we'll be using later to generate the visualizations. The next part of the how-to, once you've created your collation model, is to create an image list. What an image list does is it gives the model access to the image files, one image per page or per leaf that you've included in your model. And this means that you can visualize it in ways that include the page images. You don't have to do this. If you only want to look at diagrams, you don't need to make an image list and you can skip to the next part. But I'm gonna show you how to make an image list from a manuscript that is on open. Essentially what an image list is, is, is it's a spreadsheet, which you can create using Excel, that has two columns. The first column has the folio numbering or page numbering, and then the second column has a URL to the image file that corresponds with the folio number or page number. So it only works for manuscripts that are online, and we don't actually import the images as part of the process. So when you have your finished visualization at the end, it's just going to point to the images wherever they are. So we have developed a Google spreadsheet that you can use to make it easy to create an image file from a manuscript that's unopened. The Collins Hours is unopened, so we can go ahead and do this. As you'll see when you open up the open image list template, you can't edit it. It is locked to editing. So the first thing you're gonna have to do is make your own copy of the spreadsheet. The way you do that is you go up to File, Make a Copy. So we go File, Make a Copy, and you can call it whatever you want. I am going to be calling this Collins Hours. Hours Image List. I will save it. And then here is a whole new copy of the file that you can edit on your own drive, and we'll close that. The first thing you need to do is to create a list of image URLs. So you need to go to open and find the manuscript. I have already opened it. So here is the open record for the Collins hours. So you do that, scroll down to the images and find the image that represents the first page in your collation model. So you scroll down to the images, here we go. The images start with the front cover, which we don't need for the collation model because our collation, the the choirs, the actual choirs themselves for the manuscript begin on one, leaf one, folio one. So we start with one recto. All right, great, so here we are. So what do we do next? Take note of the number that comes just before underscore web JPEG in the file name. It will be a four digit number and it may have leading zeros. In the instance of the first one, it will definitely usually have leading zeros. So the number here is four. So come back here and put that number here. Don't include the leading zero. So we put four in that red box. All right, great. Then scroll all the way down to the end of the list of images and take note of the number of the image that represents the last page in your collation model. So here is an example from a different manuscript. This is folio 64 verso 133. This is the, this is the number we're looking for. So let's come over here. Scroll down, it will be 188. Remember, never forget <laughs> that, that this manuscript has 188 folios. So 
it ha it just so happens that the last leaf of the last choir functions as a fly leaf. Um, so it's got a fly leaf number, but it's also been foliated. So it's 188. And the number is 378. So we're going to come back over here. We'll put 378 into this red box. All right. Click on one of the image thumbnails to open it in your browser um, so we can look at the URL. There are three parts of the URL that we want to note here. All right, so I'm going to open, I will open the, it says thumbnail, but it doesn't really matter. We'll open the JPEG. And there's the last flyleaf, you see a symbol 188. And the URL will appear up here. So here is the URL. And what we're going to do is we're going to take bits of this that specify this collection and, and put it in so that the script that's running behind the scenes on the spreadsheet can actually build a whole list of URLs for us. So we come here. All right, the number after data slash, which tells us which collection your manuscript is in. So here is data with a capital D, not to be confused with the little d, capital D data, and the number here is 0031. Every collection that is in open, they're organized by institution. So the Philadelphia Museum of Art is collection number 31. Everything that we have in open that comes from the Philadelphia Museum of Art is in collection 31. So even though it's in Bibliophily, Bibliophily is actually built of manuscripts that are in many different collections. So these numbers are going to be different uh, for different manuscripts. But the number here is 31. So we come down here. Again, don't include the looting zeros. 31. The code after this number, which is the shelf mark of the manuscript. So this is, it's the Collins hours, but the, but the number that has been assigned to it within the system at the PMA is 1945 underscore 65 underscore four. So I'm going to copy that and then I will paste it. There we go. The first four digits in the file name, which is a numerical code that identifies this manuscript in the open system. This number is the shelf mark, which is probably going to be unique within the system, but it might not. If you have institutions that give their manuscripts names like Manuscript 1, you might have several Manuscript 1s in your collection. So we can't rely on this being unique. So the number that we're looking for is this number, which is the first part of the, na the file name, these four digits. These numbers will be unique in the open system. So you'll always be able to find out exactly what Manuscript it is. So we need this to build our URLs, so I'm going to copy and paste it here. There we go. And if you need help while you're doing this, there is an example here. This is um, a URL for a manuscript that's called LJS 101. It's in the Schoenberg collection, which is collection number one, and the code that's been assigned to it is 241. Next thing that we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the image URLs tab on the spreadsheet. We haven't really looked at the other tabs here, but in addition to instructions, there's image URLs and then foliated and paginated. So let's take a look at that image URLs tab. What you're going to see is a list of URLs. Now, as we've been putting the data into the cells in the instructions page, it's been building these URLs up. And if we pick one, we can just pick one at random and click on it, and it will open up. A folio in the manuscript. So these are all good, um, good URLs here. All right. So back to instructions. Click on one of the URLs and look in the formula box above. You'll see that the URL is actually a concatenate formula pulling information from hidden columns. Um, and there's a screenshot here where you can see the formula that is combining data to pull it into this. And if we go here, and click you can see indeed here is a formula that's actually building these up so what we need to do is copy the urls and then paste them as values which will turn them from the result of a 
formula into actual text that we can then save and use in the BizCall system. So how are we going to do that? We come back here, highlight the URLs representing images from the first page of your collation through the last. That is the number you put in row 12 above. I have fixed this number so it includes the verso of the last leaf. So 379. So we're going to go back to image URLs. We're going to highlight from 4 all the way to 379. So I'm just going to scroll down 379. 379. I hit shift and click and it highlights everything. And now I'm going to copy, edit, copy. And then I'm going to, oh, let's go to the instructions, see what the instructions say. Copy them. Click into the first cell of column B of the foliated tab or the paginated tab. The tab you use depends on your manuscript. Is it paginated or is it foliated? Mine is foliated and it begins on one recto. So we go to the foliated tab and here we have column A which has the numbers, column B here and we edit paste special, paste values. So we paste the values and you can see now up here that it's now actually the, the value of that URL and not the formula. Okay, and then we can sort of pick one at random. We'll pick one closer to the end of the manuscript. Here we go, just to make sure. Paste, there we go. It's blank, but it's there, that's good. Okay. So what do we do next? Now we have the image list basically, but it's here in the Google Drive. So how are we going to get it out of the Google Drive and into a format that we can use in the VizCall system? All right, image list. Now we're going to convert the Google spreadsheet to the format required by VizCall. So we come down to the bottom. It's an XML format. So what we're going to do is we're going to download the Google spreadsheet as an Excel file. So we're going to take it as an Excel file and put it on our computers. Then we're going to delete all the tabs except for that tab with the lists in it. And then we're going to save the spreadsheet as an Excel XML spreadsheet. Um, I have a Mac and so it's the 2004 XML spreadsheet. So we'll do this and then that's the file that you're going to need. So let us come here, download Microsoft Excel. There we go, over here, downloads, and open. Okay, and then the next thing is to delete all of the tabs that we don't want. So delete this, delete. Um, and you can see as soon as that first page is gone, the URLs here no longer work because there's no data for them. So we delete that delete, and then we're going to delete the last sheet, delete that, and all we have now is this foliated sheet, and now we are going to save it, file, save as, we're going to save it as an XML, so scroll down, here it is, Excel 2004 XML spreadsheet, select that, save it, some features might be lost, which is fine. Say yes. And then there it is. And you can see up here that the icon has changed. So this is now the XML file. And now we are ready to visualize this manuscript. So the very last step of making a uh, collation visualization is actually visualizing it. So you go to, we're on the how to side of the vizcall.org site. Um, we go to this funky looking URL there. We need the, the two files that we've already generated. We need the collation model that we exported from the collation modeler and then the image list, which we just made um, from Google spreadsheet and then Excel. So we just load those in. So the collation model is here. Load that in and the image list 
the Collins Hours image list there, and then hit Submit, and it thinks, and then it downloads the file here. All right, so here it opens up, and it's already unzipped it. I want you to notice that there is an open quote at the start of the file, so it automatically downs, downloads as viscall.zip. Sometimes there are two quotes. I don't know why it does that. But if there are two quotes, then your computer won't recognize that this is a zip file. So if it downloads it and you can't open it, check and see if there are these little quotes. And if there's a quote here at the end of zip, get rid of it, and then it will recognize it as a zip file. But it's already unzipped it. The folder is named according to the shelf mark. And so we'll open this up and... There are three files here. The one that we're really interested in is this one. It's the one that just ends in HTML. We're gonna open this up and see it has all of the choirs listed out. And what it does is each choir has a unit, which is a bifolio. So if I open unit one, sorry, choir one, unit one, it's uh, one that's conjoined with six and then we get the images here. So here's one verso and six recto, and then it's like we flip, it's like we pull that sheet out of the manuscript and flip it over, and then we have six verso and one recto. And then we go through and each one again does it the same thing. And six verso, four recto, four verso, three recto. This is actually the opening in the center of the choir you can see three verso and four recto would be right here. That's the center of the choir. And this is the opposite side. So again, you take it out and flip it over. And this is what you would see. But if you want to, you can actually show all the choirs. <laughs> so I hit show all the choirs and then we can scroll down. And if you remember when we started this, I pointed out that there were a lot of single leaves. So here is an example. This means that this, this leaf is missing. This leaf was removed at some point. And so we show that by this sort of X thing here. This means that it's a single leaf that was added in. And you can see, you can tell the difference here. Here is an added leaf. This is a weird thing that version one does that version two won't do. And then here's another leaf that has been, that, has, that was put in as a singleton. And as we go through, you can scroll down and see that a lot of these single leaves are miniatures with one side blank. So they were actually painted separately and then added in later. Not all of them, but some of them. So here's another one. Again, there was something um, that was done in the collation model for choir five that it's not being visualized correctly uh but this will not be an issue in choir um pardon me in uh version 2.0 so here are single a bunch of single leaves there and here were two single ones put together all right and then here we go and so you can sort of scroll through and see the physical construction of the manuscript in a way that you don't get to see them usually in online versions. So there is our successful uh, collation visualization and you could all you can make a make at this point, what you do is you make screenshots of these to include them somewhere or you can copy them more prettily. But the version 2.0 is going to be a lot more attractive than this is. So thank you for coming on this wild ride with me, and I hope that this call is useful to you. Since you've gone through all the trouble of sitting through the hour of tutorial, I thought I would give you a sneak peek of the new VC editor and how the Collins Hours diagram looks in there. So this is what the new collision modeler is going to look like. And this is where you make the changes. And you can see that I've already, I've already done Collins Hours um, we can go leaf by leaf and 
very easily you can see all of the metadata sort of associated with the leaf. Uh, it's original. We could select another one if we wanted to. And you can see, because we're using an updated model, there are going to be some more options available to you here. It is parchment. We're not noting that in this one, but if I could, it would be it would be easy enough for me to say it's parchment. It tells you immediately what leaf it's conjoined to. It's conjoined to leaf six, and you can see that here. Attachment methods. This is, again, new for the new data model. If you want to talk about how it's attached, if you have leaves that are pasted in or tipped in or otherwise, um, otherwise connected, you could do that. Is it a stub? You can actually say if it's a stub or if it's a full leaf. And then obviously numbering. There is an option for uploading images and associating with them with the sides. Different from the current version of, of our model, this is actually the front and the back of leaf. So this is the not this is not an opening, this is the front and the back of leaf one here. And we can also view recto and verso side. So you can see we can say, is it flesh or is it hair? And the image is associated here. Uh, we can also do pagination here if we want to do page numbering. Let's say that we wanted to add a leaf. We can add here. Add a leaf. Do we want it above leaf one? Let's say we'll add it above leaf one. We'll add one leaf and we'll submit it. That will create a new leaf. And then if we want to renumber, because we've just added this, presumably this will be one. Let's go all the way down and we will add, select everything. And now we can generate folio and page numbers, generate folio numbers starting at one. And now everything is updated there. So that's pretty neat. So it's got some new, new functionality some new options because we're using the updated data model. There are export options. We can export as JSON, a format that we haven't used before and we're still, we aren't really supporting it, but we have that option for you if you want to take, take it and use it as JSON. We have the regular VizCall XML. We can export as diagrams. You can actually export as a PNG file. So, if we do this, download, and then you can see it downloads as a single giant PNG file, and then you can zoom in and you can take this. This is much more user friendly than the current version, which relies on you taking um, screenshots. So there we go. And you can see here's some quite complicated thing. So just a little bitty, tiny, easy, weensy taste of this. We are anticipating that this will be ready for general use around Thanksgiving. So you have a month or so to look forward to.